This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nanofabrication. I'm your professor for this class, Chris Mack, and this is Lecture 13, which is Part 1 of our series of lectures on the topic of diffusion, in particular, dopant diffusion in semiconductor processing. Our reading for these lectures is Chapter 3 of our textbook by Campbell. Let's think about diffusion from a historical perspective. Um, the reason for doing this is the term diffusion is actually used in two different ways in the semiconductor industry. And that can be a, a more than a bit confusing. Historically, we would introduce the dopant to the wafer in the same step that we would redistribute the dopant. That is, um, we would put dopant on the top of the wafer and then let it diffuse into the wafer. So historically, diffusion has meant the combination of these two steps, introducing the dopant and then redistributing the dopant through the wafer from a, a classical diffusion uh, process. However, today, most of our processes introduce the dopant in a different step, a step called ion implantation. We're going to talk about ion implantation in a separate series of lectures later in the class. Um, in this case, we introduce the dopants, then diffusion only refers to the redistribution of the dopants from the initial distribution that comes from ion implantation. So we have to be a little bit careful uh, when we use the word diffusion because of these two slightly different meanings depending on whether we're introducing the dopant during the diffusion step or we're simply redistributing the dopants after an ion implantation step. So let's look at this earlier meaning of the word diffusion first. Dopant, uh, diffusion as a dopant introduction method. What we did is, is we added the dopants in a furnace. This furnace is very similar to the furnace we talked about in lectures on oxidation almost exactly the same kind of furnace. We don't use the exact furnace to be the same because once you put a particular dopant into a furnace, that tube essentially becomes contaminated with that dopant. And you don't want to put any wafers in there in any high, pre uh, high temperature process step unless you're performing diffusion using that same dopant. So essentially, we dedicate furnace tube particular functions. And once a furnace tube is dedicated to oxidation, for example, that's all it's used for. And once it's uh, dedicated to boron dopant introduction and diffusion, that's all that we use that tube for. But the furnaces are essentially the same. This dopant is introduced to the wafers in one of three ways. We could use a solid source. Here, Remember, we, we, we stack all the wafers up in um, a carrier, wafer, 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 all next to each other, 25, 50, 100 wafers at a time. What we're going to do with the solid source is take a disk of some dopant material, for example, boron nitride, BN, and we'll put that disk right next to the uh, wafer. So you've got the source of boron sitting right next to the wafer, and you'll alternate wafers and these disks of, of solid dopant sources in the carrier. Keep the thing up and that's how you introduce the dopant. Another approach is to use a liquid source. Uh, for example, uh, POCL, P-O-C-L-3, commonly pronounced POCL in the industry, as a source of phosphorus. We'll bubble nitrogen through this liquid and we'll get a vapor of that liquid into the gas. Uh, that gas then, um, that vapor then will deposit on the wafer in the furnace and result in uh, dopant introduction. Note that almost all of these liquid sources have halides uh, attached to them. For the same reason that we used HCl in our oxidation step, these halides will uh, scavenge up metal ions and keep them away uh, from our wafer. And then finally, we might have a gas source as the dopant uh, method. Uh, most of, of, of our dopant introduction methods in diffusion will use liquid sources. They're the most common. Then we will put that dopant through one of these three approaches on the top of the wafer. Once the dopant lands on the top of the wafer, it will diffuse in. 
and that's the diffusion step. Generally, we want to run these um, dopants at or exceeding the solid solubility limit of the dopant in silicon. In other words, we pile up so much dopant on the top that at the very top of the wafer, the concentration is equal to the solid solubility limit at the temperature of the diffusion. That means we have very good control of the concentration because you can't get it higher than that. We run it in excess and we always have that uh, constant concentration at the top of the wafer. It's a very common approach. But this method of dopant introduction, as I said before, is not very common today. There are some applications though where we use it. Uh, this was commonly used for device generations older than about two microns, two microns and before. Uh, two micron style process generations were first introduced in the industry in about 1980. So prior to 1980, we always used this as our dopant introduction method. Uh, since about 1980, ion implantation has become dominant. But there are still some processes out there in the world where we make older device generations. Um, and, and we still use this approach because it's inexpensive. We sometimes use it when we need very, very high levels of dopant uh, for devices like bipolar uh, in their emitter um, formation. Again, we do it because it's cheaper than ion implantation. And sometimes we'll do it for polysilicon doping. Here we deposit polysilicon over the entire wafer, but we want to dope the polysilicon to make it more conductive. And this is an inexpensive way of uh, performing that doping. All of these applications are generally for older generation technologies or, or devices that have a very low cost uh, manufacturing requirements. Ion implantation is just a little more expensive. But the main reason we're going to think about diffusion and the main reason we're going to focus on diffusion as an important process step to understand is because of the dopant redistribution aspect of it. Whether we introduce the dopant through the diffusion step or we introduce the dopant with ion implantation, what we want to know is how it diffuses in this high temperature step. So we have some initial distribution of dopant. It's usually supplied by ion implantation. Then, um, if we've supplied the dopant by ion implantation, why do we have a, a, a diffusion step at all? Well, ion implantation, uh, which we'll talk a lot more about later, it takes ions, accelerates them to a very high velocity, and slams them into the wafer. Think about shooting a bullet into a tree. What happens to the bark? What happens to the uh, the tree ring structure as the bullet embeds itself in the tree. Well, it destroys it. The whole structure uh, of, of the fibers of the tree all get broken. Well, the same thing happens when we slam an ion into the crystal of silicon. It, it implants the ion in the silicon wafer, but it completely busts up the silicon. In the region where we've implanted, we create amorphous silicon. Well, amorphous silicon is not the kind of semiconductor we want. We want single crystal silicon. And as we've said before, our dopants are not activated until they become part of the crystal structure. As a result, we, we need to recrystallize this amorphous silicon. The amorphous silicon is sitting on top of our single crystal wafer. And so when we begin this high temperature step, the bottom part of the wafer acts as the seed crystal to regrow the crystal up from the bottom to the top of the wafer. We, we call this annealing the crystal, annealing out the damage caused by ion implantation, regrowing the crystal in the way we want it. At the same time, the dopants become uh, a part of the crystal structure. So dopant atoms occupy lattice sites in that crystal and therefore become activated. But since we're operating these, uh, this annealing step, at a very high temperature, inevitably we have diffusion of the dopants. And so the dopants don't stay where we put them, they move around within the crystal. Our goal is to predict the final dopant distribution at the end of this diffusion step, at the end of this annealing step. So in one sense, uh, annealing is required to fix the damage of, uh, of ion implantation, 
And diffusion is simply a side effect of this annealing process. Um, but of course, if we design our, propos, our process properly, the end result will be a dopant distribution that's exactly what we wanted it to be from the beginning. So when we design uh, a device with a particular dopant distribution in mind, we have to find an implant and diffusion combination that produces the final dopant distribution to be exactly what we want it to be. So how do we predict what that final distribution is going to be? Well, we need to understand diffusion. Now, this is not a class where we're going to derive the diffusion equation or go through uh, the physics of diffusion. Um, hopefully, you've already had a course that has taught you that. But let's review it just in case. We start with Fick's first law of diffusion. And we actually saw this before uh, a couple of times, actually, in oxidation and in PN junctions. But we have um, a fixed law here. And then we have the continuity equation, which is a mass balance. What do we have with Fick's first law? First, we have a material flux. This is the, um, the concentration, change in concentration, or the, the, the flux, uh, the, the movement of uh, the concentration of material per unit area per time. Uh, let me say that again. Um, the number of particles per unit area per unit time. Uh, and it's equal to the concentration gradient, dc dx. Uh, the co dopant concentration is C, multiplied by the diffusivity of the dopant in silicon. So those are the, the, the pieces of Fick's first law. Fick's first law comes about simply because of the randomness of diffusion. Diffusion is a random walk. Things randomly move to the left or the right without any rhyme or reason. It just moves. And uh, given a random movement of particles, when you're done, you'll have more particles in the low concentration region, the originally low concentration region, and less particles in the originally high concentration region. So that the net flux of material is proportional to the concentration gradient. And in fact, goes against the concentration gradient. It tends to smooth out any gradients in concentration you might have. The continuity equation is simply a mass balance. If I have a region uh, here and here, a, a little bit apart from each other, and I have a change in the flux. So at the left-hand side, I have higher flux than on the right-hand side. The result is going to be an accumulation of concentration over time. So anytime the flux changes with position, we get an accumulation or a depletion of the concentration with time. Simple mass balance called the continuity equation. If we combine Fick's first law with the continuity equation, we get Fick's second law. So I simply take the derivative of Fick's first law with respect to x and set it equal, substitute it into Fick's second law, or excuse me, so <laughs> Let's say that again. Take the derivative of Fick's first law with respect to x, substitute that into the continuity equation, and we get Fick's second law, which is shown here. Uh, in one dimension, the concentration is a function of x and time t in one dimension, but in three dimensions, it would be a function of x, y, and z. And uh, so here we show what that equation would look like in three dimensions, where I've simply used uh, as a shorthand notation the del operator. Uh, the del operator is simply dx plus uh, ddx plus ddy plus ddz. Um, we're going to work our problems in class in the next lecture only in one dimension, but of course in real three-dimensional devices we have a three-dimensional solution required. Our goal then is going to be to solve the diffusion equation. What does it take to solve the diffusion equation? Well, we need three things. Well, we need an initial condition. What is the concentration of the dopant everywhere at the beginning at t equals 0? Then we need two boundary conditions for each dimension. Uh, it's a second order equation, second order in x, uh, taking the second derivative with respect to x. So to integrate that twice, I have to have two boundary conditions, 
for those two integrations. Uh, so uh, those two boundary conditions are, for example, an X would be the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Um, for X and Y, it would be the left-hand side and the right-hand side and the front and the back. And X, Y, and Z would include the top and the bottom. So for every dimension in the problem, we have two boundary conditions. And finally, we have to know what the diffusivity is. The knowledge of the diffusivity, uh, we need to know the diffusivity as a function of x, y, z, and t. It might be constant, but it might be changing uh, in all of those dimensions. Quite frequently, the diffusivity is a function of the concentration of the dopant. And the concentration of the dopant, in turn, is a function of x, y, z, and time. Uh, so, but if we know the relationship between diffusivity and concentration, then we can use this to solve our equation. This is where all the complications come from. Knowing what the diffusivity is and how it varies with position and time is what makes solving the diffusion equation difficult and complicated. If the diffusivity is constant, then our solutions become relatively easy. Uh, in fact, uh, in the next lecture, we're going to solve the one-dimensional diffusion equation for some common initial conditions and boundary conditions assuming constant diffusivity. Um, and then we'll talk about what happens when the diffusivity is not constant after that. So let's look at what we've learned. After listening to this lecture, you should easily be able to answer these questions. If you can't, then you need to go back and review some of the material. What are the two meanings of the term diffusion in semiconductor processing? Explain how dopants are introduced during an old style diffusion step. Why is dopant diffusion inevitable after ion implantation? And finally, what does one need to know in order to solve the diffusion equation? Well, in our next lecture, we're going to supply some of those things we need to know to solve the diffusion equation, and we'll solve it in a couple of common uh, cases.